General. Who up? Platform's yours. I'm on. Range lead the way. All the way. Afternoon to you all. I uh, just want to tell you how great a pleasure it is. What a great pleasure it is to see you all here and meet with you all at this convention. My wife and I have had a very enjoyable experience. And we've run into a lot of old friends. Some in the Mike Force and some from now, you troops from El Salvador. And uh, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to run into you again and uh, share some thoughts with you about El Sal because uh, it's an important little operation. But keep in mind, as I go through this thing, it was a little operation, not a big operation. And it was never intended to be that way. Even though you will have academic people stand up and scream about huge military presence and so forth and a huge budget, it wasn't. It was small. And it was intended to be small. <clears throat> the operations in El Salvador have gained interest over the past with particularly the military academic community. The, um, the staff co the War College and JSAW in particular have done a lot of studies on it. And there is a, and because, and we have to ask ourselves why. Well, the reason why is there's a parallel being drawn between El Salvador as a success and what's going on in the Middle East. And that's fine. They're both clone operations to a degree. But the Middle East operation dwarfs the El Salvador operation by comparison, I would remind you. And I would say this because El Salvador is a little country the size of the state of Massachusetts. The subversive element in El Salvador never exceeded, as far as I could tell, 15,000. The Salvadoran army itself never got above 20,000. So we're not talking about real big numbers. We were talking about, at the top, nine, uh, 19 helicopters, Hueys. We had old World War II fighter planes, which we used. And we could have had, but we never used, US Air Force gunships, except the AC-130 is a very good surveillance bird, and we used it for that. I swear to you all, we never fired the gunship on El Salvadoran soil. And had we done it, we would have all gone into civilian life very shortly. <laughs> now, some reasons for why the academic community wants to pursue this are obvious, but they're worth mentioning. First of all, El Salvador was a success. No question about it. We got elected a democratic government in a country that had been ruled by out of the back pocket of the wealthy, a military junta, and then a president, a caretaker president, Magana, established primarily by at the influence of our embassy. Secondly, our, involvement, our military involvement in El Salvador was small. 55 people had, was, was the rule, was the protocol on that. And that was etched in cement. Let me assure you, as one ambassador called me in and called my predecessor in and said, Colonel, I just want to make sure you understand the number 55. Do you understand the number 55? To which we both said, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. We do understand 55, and we know what you're talking about. He said, well, let me put it to you in other terms. At that point in time, you go to 56, you will be the second person to leave town. <laughs> the war would unfold. Although 50, uh, 83, 84, 85 were important years in, years in the evolution of the Salvadoran conflict, the war would unfold from 1989, 
1981 to 1992. 1992, it was resolved by, and this is the fourth, it was overshadowed, excuse me, it was overshadowed by events elsewhere and swept under the rug. Initially, it was a hot issue. But by 1985, nobody in Washington really gave two hoots and a damn about it because there was other bigger things on the plate. Noriega and then uh, Desert Storm, to name a couple. And El Salvador just kind of bubbled along after that. And then, of course, in, the, in 1992, the Chapultepec Agreement went into effect. Uh, it was partially brokered by Ambassador Negroponte in Mexico City, where I was happened to be the dat for Ambassador Negroponte. And it's kind of interesting for me because I was on an operational in 10, day, 10 years before that, and all of a sudden there I'm seeing the thing <laughs> negotiating to a peaceful settlement. The, co the conflict would end in, in terms favorable to the government of El Salvador. Yes. But those terms also established the FMLN, who were the principal communist and their communist subversive element before that, as a, a participant in the political process. And I guess you know who's in charge of El Salvador now. And all you got to do is look in the streets and see the Mata Salvatrucha people running around to see what's going on. The FMLN is totally in charge, as they gained control of Nicaragua, too, for what it's worth. <clears throat> as I said, El Salvador was the size of the state of Massachusetts, and there never was a in a population of five million. Moreover, the massive uh, military aid package was 80% developmental, 20% Salvadoran military. To the contrary, the Salvadoran military, our military presidents in this Salvadoran conflict, and this is important, served actually to dampen the nature of the violence of the conflict, particularly in two sides. The ultra left, yes. And the ultra right, yes. The death squads. If you all don't remember about that, that was a real sticky wicket for us. Okay, let's go over and uh, let's go over some historical background on this, and I'll step to the map here. First of all, you probably remember the soccer war. I take my. Can I get the other yeah, map? I yeah, yeah, could, yeah, and could I get the other map, please? Yeah, bring that up. If you please. Let me see if I can turn this off. Keep, keep All right. Yeah, incidentally, here are the, the former us. Chris puts this up. Here are the infiltrators yes, coming in from. Yeah. Joe, the microphone. Microphone. Joe, good. microphone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The wonders of the electronic era. Can you hear me now? Negative. Stand by. Check. Check. <laughs> what, what can I say? Can't teach an old dog new tricks, and I'm old. Uh, what you need to look at here, this is El Salvador in, in the Central American context. And you see all these people who were supporting the Nicaraguans who were a communist regime, Danny Ortega in particular. Then you have Honduras right here, which I'll talk to about in a minute. And Guatemala didn't play that much of an issue in the thing. However, you see the support lines coming out, and one of the support lines, one of the major support lines, went like this and came into Usultan on the coast in El Salvador. And we played hard. We worked hard on that. The U.S. military worked hard on trying to turn that thing off. And then, of course, the rest of it came through here. Okay, Chris, can you give me that other Can you give me that other one? Okay, here we go. The soccer war. Honduras and El Salvador went, at, uh, went to war with each other in 1969. 
and they bombed and strafed each other over this area right here until literally they both ran out of av gas and ordnance and the war ended, the air war ended. And then the OAS decided that they would negotiate a settlement, which they did. And so, in the settlement, here's what developed. You, you can't see it in Honduras, but this area in El Salvador is a carbon copy of what happened in Honduras. These areas were called in Spanish bolsones. That is the word pocket. And what happened is this real estate in the Andes archipelago was left open. And the government of Honduras especially said, okay, campesinos, if you want farmland, we've got it for you. Move in. And move in they did all along here. Now, you've got poor campesinos, and you've got communists running around, and I don't have to tell you what happens after that. And the influx came into El Salvador. Now, why El Salvador? El Salvador was actually on the verge of achieving economic takeoff in 1979, when this whole thing started up. So it was economically desirable, and it's sitting right in the middle of Honduras and Nicaragua, and on the way down to Manuel Noriega. So the communists and, everybody, and the liberals, uh, ultra liberals, who didn't like what was going on in El Salvador and the government, which nobody really did, thought that this would be a good idea to start the insurgency to take over El Salvador. And that, in a nutshell, is how it, how it evolved. In 1979, the oligarch government, which was in effect, was taken over by a military junta. Surprise, surprise. This doesn't happen in Latin America very much, but it did happen in El Salvador. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was stable, it stabilized and went on. In 1981, however, comma, the Salvadoran National Guard assassinated Archbishop Romero. Now, they'll deny this, but I'm telling you that's what happened. Also, at the same time, the same wonderful people, four of them got drunk one Thursday night and killed, raped and killed four marrying old nuns. You all remember that one? Yeah. I'll tell you, I talked to a guy from Delta Force who's in here right now. Delta had to go in and exhume the bodies and bring them back to the United States. Hats off to you. Good job. Then, after the marrying old nuns, we had the evolution of some, another phenomenon on the left, the evolution of UCA, the University of Central America in, 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 in San Salvador. Now, if you wanted to find communists in Central San El Salvador at that time, you went to the university campus of UCA. Now, you people that were there, I'm sure you remember that. In fact, El Scheffel, Commander El Scheffelberger was murdered on the campus of UCA. Then in 1982, we established the 50, our government established the 55 man limit. I'm going to go over this real fast because I was talking to some of you about it, and it's an interesting story of how these things happen. This was not a great decision-making process or not. It just happened, and this is how. Uh, one Friday afternoon before the president's birthday weekend, the, after President Reagan's inauguration, the people in OSD came up with the idea of putting in a bunch of military force into El Salvador and killing a communist for Christ. Some of us down on the third floor in the army said, how are you going to measure success on this thing this time? 
because we don't want to go into the body count game. True. And we were strong enough so that we got the senior guys upstairs to shut up for a while. And then my boss, two-star General Schweitzer, who was command, uh, who was chief of strategy plans and policy, got a hold of it on Friday afternoon. On Sunday morning, I got a call at home and said that General Schweitzer wanted to see me in his office immediately. This is Washington's birthday weekend. I went in there and I became a party to, not a party to, a witness to the establishment of the 55-man limit. General Schweitzer called General Nutting, sink south. And it was a Wally Bob type of a thing and I'm sitting here like a like curly-headed kid in the third row, you know, wondering what I, if I ought to even be here. And uh, finally, they got it right down. To General Schweitzer said to General Nutting on the telephone, Wally, how many men do you have in El Salvador? And he said, I have 55. And he said, Wally, is that enough? And Wally said it was. And that's how the 55-man limit got his family. <laughs> and it went on cement. Now that's funny because of the way it happened, but it wasn't funny after because I swear to all of you, if you wanted to lose your military career, go over the 55 man limit or be part of number 56. You, cannot, you could not go there. And it was in cement and it was watched very carefully. Next of all, also in 82, General Fred Warner wrote a watershed study for the establishment of a democratic government in El Salvador. It was good, it was great, it was everything. It was forced, and it ended up with forced development and a very detailed strategy, point by point, how, how they did it. That was on the street, it was approved by our government and approved by the caretaker Salvador government. In 1984, also, President Magana was established as a caretaker president in El Salvador, primarily at the pre at, from pressure from our government through our embassy, Ambassador Hinton. Then, in 1983, and this is a watershed year for the whole thing, Plan Makalishquad, the national plan was written and established by a joint uh, Salvadoran American group. John Wagle, Colonel John Wagelstein was very important on it. General Fred Warner was very important on it. And it was approved by the Salvadoran government, but I'd be assured it was approved by Ambassador Dean Hinton. And it was in cement and it kicked off in March of 83. 84 and eight, yeah. On down the line, uh, John, I replaced John Wagelstein in 83. And then in, eight, in 1983 also, Ambassador Pickering came in to replace Ambassador Hinton. And this is a watershed time, a complete change in leadership. But the biggest thing was a complete change in policy. Let me tell you what Ambassador Pickering said to us when he came in, he said that we would try to establish control over 80% of the territory and 90% of the population in two years. He said that we, and listen to this because it's important, he said we would marginalize the FMLN. He did not say we were going to military, militarily knock him out, okay? And this is very, very important because this is what we're living with today. And he wanted to dry up the external support coming in. Especially here in Hukaran. And he was adamant about this and, he, and we went at it with a, with a purpose after this.
During 1980, uh, during, uh, 1983 to 1984, we were on again, off again national elections. And I'll go into why they were off again, because it's important. The, uh, it finally, they finally came back on in March of 1983. We had another hiccup in the system, and uh, after they had, we had to have a runoff in April of 83. In June 1983, a new elected president of El Salvador was inaugurated. That was a real big step because this was a no fooling, no kidding constitutional democracy. Then in 85, a bunch of things happened on and off after that. Did the war go away? No. But you'll see that we dampened the war completely. And we had the murder of the Marines in the Zona Rosa, where they were recreating down there, where they shouldn't have been, where I told the gunnery sergeant to get them out. And he gave me one of these, why well, are you going to keep them on down on the farm? Answers. Now they're dead. <clears throat> then, in about 1987, we had uh, Sergeant, yeah, Greg Fronius was killed at El Paraiso. This was a black eye on our military because we actually bought, caused this by not complying with our own SOPs. Not the least of which, and this is a small thing, but uh, let me tell you this. A lot of us really strongly believe in this. The buddy team concept, which was the rule from me in the mill group, in the field, anywhere you went in El Salvador. Greg Ferronius was in El Paraiso alone and was killed in action. And he stood the, stood the fight that night all by himself and he was killed. And I, my boss was so angry about this, General Stuth in, in Fort Bragg that he sent me and Sergeant Major Homestock down to investigate this. And that's why I know quite a bit about what happened to Sergeant Ferronius. Then in 1987, talking to another ex-task uh, force guy, we had a hostage barricade situation evolve in the Sheraton Hotel in San Salvador. I warned people about this when I was there. I got all our people, all the military American people out of the Sheraton. They stayed with to stay out of the Sheraton and stay off the, stay off the Zona Rosa. Well, they were back in the Sheraton and the F, FPLL, the FPL came in and seized the Sheraton Hotel and all the people in it and barricaded them in there. That was way beyond anything in the mill group to take care of. And of course, it had to be resolved externally Ladies and gentlemen, I'll go no further with that when they resolved it. The operations in the field continued, but at a, at a lessened lesson, uh, height of uh, intensity. Actually, the FPL and PRP, the active military arms of the insurgency, resorted more to selective terrorism against, directed against the United States Armed Forces and our support. 19, eight, 1992, as I said, the Chapultepec effect went in, uh, accord went to effect, sponsored by uh, us, Ambassador Negroponte, and everybody else that wanted to play or pretended to play in the situation. Let me give you something on a friendly situation now. Go back to 1983. Here we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to point here and hold this. There we have, in this area, in this area of Santa Ana, one brigade. In this area was a second brigade in the Huachapan, Sonsonati, over in there. In this area was the famous, infamous Guazapa volcano area and Xalatenango and Cabanas, where many Sal uh, Salvadoran government officials tried to take effect. But this is really con was controlled by the 
by the subversives. This was really uh, controlled by the subversives. Then we have, that's the third brigade. The fourth brigade was in uh, San Vicente, and that's where the national plan was running out of. And that was a very important thing, and we had to keep control of that in San Vicente. Third brigade. Fourth brigade in Usultan, and this is the area I told you about the infiltration, which we had to get control of. Fifth brigade was in San Miguel. San Miguel would be a focal point for hostile action, but it also was the uh, economic center for El Salvador. And then here was La, La Union, and we had a SEAL unit here. We had, okay, we had the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth brigade here, area here, the Salvador Navy here, and our SEAL team detachment with an operational mission and with uh, with a training mission. That, that basically was the way the, the uh, military, uh, uh, friendly forces shook out in, in 83. Now, the MOD was a fellow by the name of Vides Casanova. And General Vides was a good man. He was less military oriented than he was a pretty slick, shrewd politician. But he was the military boss of the Salvadoran Armed Forces. So we had to work with him. And as I said, in 83, we established the National Plan, Plan Makalish Quad, approved by everybody and executed. Enemy forces. We have in this bull zone the FPL. This is a very violent organization. And then we had over here the PRP in the eastern half. This was an even more violent operation. Over all of this, we had the political arm. And this was not monolithic, but they would let you believe that they were the FMLN. Okay, and very briefly, that's the enemy situation in El Salvador at the start of the national plan where we started to move forward with the operation. The uh, size of these uh, brigades was three, about uh, three, three battalions, so five battalions, and immediate reaction battalions, which were 600 in strength. The... Uh, what do we got here? Oh yeah. And beside the size of each one of these units, of four, of four, of five thousand, about five thousand five hundred here, effectives, they had attachments to them, which we called masses. And I want to tell you, this is one of the most revolting thing I ran into, and in that ugly little war in El Salvador. These poor souls were campesinos grabbed out of the bolsons and pressed into service to carrying parties, cooks, foraging parties, and any menial tasks they could find. When we liberated these people, they were starving, they were without uh, security, and they were unclothed. It was an ugly situation, but that's the way communists do business. After uh, Ambassador Pickering announced his uh, new policy for the conduct of the war, we, we embarked on this thing in, 19, in uh, 1983 in September. Also in 1983 in September, the PRP attacked San Miguel. And they did it up brown this time. San Miguel is right here. They attacked, they overran it, and they dropped the spans on the Elkhorn Highway on the east and on the west 
of the city. I was on a volcano, accidentally I was up there, believe me, on a, on a Saturday night when this attack went down. And it was impressive to see the level of expertise of these subversive uh, military units. Dropping these two bridges was not some little gorilla running around out there with firing trains. This was an engineer outfit. This is an engineer operation, and they did it. They did a good job of it, and they closed down the eastern section of El Salvador for quite a while until we could fix, get around those bridges. Also at the same time, they attacked the compound, the, the brigade compound. Up here, where I was, was the department of Morazan, and that was where they had three little uh, Casador battalions of 400 of 200 men apiece, defending the, the town of San Francisco Gotera. Now, Gotera was uh, a hotbed for the PRP, but also they were confronted by a fairly determined Salvadoran leader, uh, Jorge Cruz. Now, Cruz had taken this area, but when San Miguel went down, you can see that his only way to resupply that was to open it up or buy helicopters. And 18 helicopters aren't going to be enough to resupply a unit that size and that distance. So, after I got back to San Salvador, we discussed where we were going to go next, and I got with Ambassador Pickering, or he got with me, I mean, I should say, and he dis expressed his displeasure with the ineptitude of the Salvadoran military, and he was right. And it got worse from there. In, uh, in early October, in this area, in the Guazapa area, in the, in the third brigade area, the FPL, the, no, wait, let me, let me digress just a minute. Also during this area, the national plan, and in in, again in this area in Guazapa, the FBL did something very, very strange and uncharacteristic of their operations. They went into a town of Nueva Granada on Friday night. They rounded up the militia in that little town, brought them to the square, village square, for execution, but they didn't stop there. They brought all their families out to witness this execution. You have no idea how this backfired on them, and you can be assured that we jumped on that real fast and elaborated on it real fast. The FPL subsequently would change its leadership. Comandante Maria would classic LATAM politics, disappear. Rumored that she went to Nicaragua. Comandante Carpio committed suicide by shooting himself twice in the back of the head. <laughs> Here we go. But the military, as I said, well, then we had the attack on uh, something on Tenon Single. The FBL came back to kind of regroup after the disaster in uh, Nueva Granada. And on a Sunday afternoon, in a little town of Tenon Single, up in this area here, they attacked that city. Not to wreck it, but just to hold it. Because they figured, and they were right, that the Salvadoran helicopter gunships would marshal and fly out there and shoot the subversives up. Now, subversives were smart. They got in the city and they shot at the helicopter from out of houses. And I guess you know the rest of the story. And they stayed there for the rest of Sunday. And it just terrorized that population in Tenancingo. And the Casador battalions that were there surrendered. Three of them. Now you see which way this thing was going, and going very rapidly. Then, in November, again back in uh, 
the east and uh, San Miguel. We have the incident at Ciudad Barrios. Ciudad Barrios was a big town, big city, up in the right up near the Bolsonis, with a huge coffee production operation going on, factory, plantation, so forth. The subversives came into Ciudad Barrios and completely destroyed the coffee operation in that little city. It was so bad, and of course the Salvador military didn't respond to get at them until Sunday, when one of the new immediate reaction battalions went to Ciudad Barrios, along with me, Sergeant Hazelwood, and Sergeant Cargo. We went up here, and here's what happened. We got off, they dropped, uh, we got uh, the Air Force commander to drop us off, outside the city and we walked in. Now the subversives were still in the mountains around Ciudad Barrios at this time on Sunday morning. The Autonomous Battalion had gone back into the city to try to secure it. And as I walked down the city, this young woman, young, well she wasn't that young, she probably in her 30s, came out of the, came out of the church. She was just coming home from Mass. She had a pretty a member. She was dressed in a nice yellow dress, and she was going home for Sunday dinner. I stopped her and I talked to her for quite a while and I asked her what had happened. Because if you really want to find out in something like this, and this I found out from one of my NCOs, find an old woman or find a young woman and ask them the tough questions, they'll give you the right answers. And she told me this. She said the subversives came into the town of of Sierra Barrios on Friday night, and they said they were going to destroy the finca. We begged them not to destroy the finca. They said they were going to destroy, get rid of the militia. The militia figured that they would do this, and they bugged. The subversives then completely, and this is a woman to me, destroyed the finca completely, everything, and a lot of the city of Ciudad Barrios. And then in an incredible moment in, in my life, in my military career, this lovely creature with nothing left said, would you, can I invite you and your cohorts to have Sunday dinner with me? Which is a big tradition in El Salvador, for those of you that don't know it, is Sunday dinner. I did not, I could not take her up on it because I had to, I had to think about getting out of there myself. And, uh, but I tell, I share this with you to show you how one of the uglier aspects of this ugly little war. We went from Ciudad Barrios up north of San Francisco Gotera that afternoon because the department commander had a unit up there and he said he could probably get a helicopter in from the Air Force to pick me up. And I had to get out of there by nightfall or kiss my career goodbye, if not something else. And uh, we went up there and we saw what was going on. We had an IR, an immediate reaction, that immediate reaction battalion kind of consolidated in the area, kind of. And we had the situation in Ciudad Barrio still undetermined. I called, uh, I decided that I better get back to town and tell people what was going on. I called for a helicopter and I could not get a helicopter. Surprise, surprise, from anybody, Americans or Salvadorans. So my two NCOs, sharp SF NCOs that they are, Hazelwood and Cargill said, well, why don't we jump on one of these livestock trucks going south to San Miguel? Not a dumb idea, but it was kind of funny because I got a picture of me in the back of this livestock truck with pigs in it, and I'm sitting there in what was affectionately referred to thereafter as the pig truck evacuation. (laughs) 
The, uh, we got down to, anyway, we got down to go to and we went into town. We got, when we got into town that following day, on Monday, I was advised that the Vice President of the United States was going to come to El Salvador before Christmas and deliver an ultimatum to the Salvadoran government and the Salvadoran military. To which I said, okay, <laughs> what, am I, what do you want me to do? <laughs> then they said, well, we do have a little thing for you to do. You're going to get your counterpart, General Vides, and you two are going to go to Washington, D.C. and testify before the Kissinger Committee on the netness of the Salvadoran military. I was elated about this opportunity. Because <laughs> when I told Vides, his, op his reaction to it was absolutely the same, if not a little bit stronger. Do I really have to do this? <laughs> to which I said, I really wish you would because I really have to do it. And so we went. And we also had to go and testify before the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Another hardball. Because nobody liked the Salvadoran military at the time. And I can understand why. They weren't doing very well. So we went to Washington. First, we went to testify before the Kissinger Committee in, over at Foggy Baden. And they were tough on us. They were tough on Vetus. And they read them the riot act and said that these were, you know, these are civilian polit they're civilian diplomats, not military people. And during that time, I was sitting there, sitting in the back, like, as I said, with a curly-headed kid in the back row there. And S Secretary Kissinger suddenly wheeled around in his seat and he said, do you have, even have a plan for all this? And I, I was taken quite aback. I'm just a colonel, you know. But I did have a plan. Remember, I, we had the national plan. And I said, yes, sir, we have a plan. And as a matter of fact, I have a copy that I can give to you. He waved me off on that. He didn't, I'm sure he didn't want to fool around. <laughs> <laughs> then we sallied forth from Foggy Bottom and went across the river to the JCS. I got over there a little ahead of Vetus. I didn't go with him. And I got with some of the action officers on the joint staff. And I said, listen, you've got to help me out on this. We're in a bind. We're either going to quit supporting the government of El Salvador or we're going to fall in line and support them for what they're trying to do. Take it easy when you're going after General Vides. He's under a lot of pressure. The chiefs were very good about it. They encouraged him and they questioned him thoroughly, but they encouraged him in what he was doing. Then Vetus did something which was probably the turning point in this whole thing. He pulled out his papers and said, I have reorganized, completely reorganized the Salvadoran military. Put it on the table. He said, I can explain it to you. But the top of the list was, I have negated what was called the Tonda system. And here's how military officers used to get promoted in the Salvadoran Armed Forces. They were promoted based on their class, their class year group, and their class standing. And to a guy like me and Joe Mayo, who were at the bottom of our class, top 85% of our classes, that, that was really a kick in the face. <laughs> so Vitas kicked that over. But, oh, all serious, seriously aside, that was a very touchy situation because he was risking a revolt in his own ranks against him. And we've already seen in the history that they would do that in a heartbeat if they could get together the support to do it. That said, we returned to San Salvador and here comes President, Vice President Bush on Sunday, that's two days later. And we got a, had a get together at, uh, at the ambassador's house, and President Bush just read the riot act of the whole bunch. 
but they'd already heard from me and from Ambassador Negroponte a little bit more subdued terms, albeit. And from the JCS, a little bit more subdued terms. So it wasn't probably that big a deal and things, except it was very embarrassing. Believe me, I was sitting there. I was embarrassed. So, was that the end of the bad downfall? No. Uh, yeah. This was 1980, uh, 1983, December 83. Now, we're going into, significantly enough, New Year's, New Year's Eve, 84. The PRP came back again. And strange to say, they completely separated the East from the West. They dropped the main span on the Elkan Highway across the Olympa River right here, and they interdicted what I called the world's longest extension plug, which was the electrical system which came from Cerrone Grandy Power Station all the way to San Miguel and La Union. That was it. No electricity, no commerce, no nothing on the, second, on the 1st of January. But Vetus was smart about this. This was a bad time, folks. He got on his feet on New Year's Day and got with his officers and said, if you do not come together and work, this is going to get worse and real fast because the Americans are going to leave. And they came together with new leadership and went to the field and did some real fighting and fighting to secure the upcoming elections. And the elections we had particularly in this area right here in San Salvador and around. We had the first round of the elections in March 15, 84. Now, we had to have a runoff. But the embassy was measuring success to the election based on a 70% participation in the elections by the populace. Now, how are you going to measure something like this? Well, I'll tell you how we did. We're a little smarter than we gave ourselves credit for. We turned on Radio Venceremos, the propaganda arm of the FMLN, and they told us exactly who voted and who didn't vote because they took the downside of it and amplified the fact that these precincts did not vote. So it was easy for us, even dummies like me, to total the thing up and come up with a number of precincts that did vote. We got three quarters off of that, and that was a real big plus. Now, we had the runoff. And we have Sam McGill, too. Just before, oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me tell you one more war story about Sam McGill on Election Day. Remember I told you they dropped the power line. We got the power, I didn't, but the Salvadorans got the power line up uh, about Wednesday. And they said, well, we're going to turn the current on. I said, no, 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 don't turn the current off. Wait until Sunday morning, just before the elections. Otherwise, they'll just drop it again. But what I didn't really figure happened was a bonanza. We turned the power off. At 4 o'clock on Sunday morning, we turned the power on in eastern El Salvador. And we caught those bastards in the streets trying to screw up the elections. <laughs> and the Salvadoran military, and they fired them up big time. And the elections went off, and as I said, we got a 75, per, a three quarters voting rate on it. Now, the next runoff elections, were in about, uh, were in April. Just before the runoff elections, the Sunday, the several days before the, the runoff elections, the PRP was sappers, attacked our American team at San Salvador, at, at, at San Miguel. They did not go after anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, they were after the U.S. Army Special Forces team, trainers, 
in San Miguel. About two o'clock in the morning, I heard, I got a hold of this, and I went out looking for a helicopter. After I got permission from the DCM to go out there, which he was not happy about. And I, that was a hard thing to do, too. When you're dealing with civilians in a situation like this, they have a funny way of looking at things. And they're a lot different than what we do. And I told Mr. Blakely, Ken Blakely, I said, I've got men out there on the ground. I've got to go out there. And he finally saw it my way, and I went. I went on a new helicopter up from Panama, which had no pedestal mounts in it for a machine gun. So we had lived on that, and we put two M60s on bungee cords from the roof of the helicopter. That's fine. You can shoot out the side. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, when you bank a helicopter to come in, your main rover is coming right in the line of fire. And I was very concerned about that as the only guy in the helicopter that these guys would not get fired at and take under fire and hit the main rotor. It didn't happen, praise the Lord. I landed and I went and I crawled up to back of the first fighting position in the special forces position. They had prepared for this. They're not dummies. They had prepared for something like this and they were ready for it. And they piled them up. And I'll tell you what I saw. I saw these Latin subversives walking around like zombies. They were drugged. I couldn't tell you for sure because I couldn't have tested them. But they sure looked like they were drugged. Coming at suicide mission, coming at our special forces. And I went up to the back of uh, the first fighting possession where Leroy Sena was conducting the defense. And I said, unfortunately for me, I said, Leroy, and I looked at the pile of uh, M60 cartridges in the bottom of the hole and the people out in front. I said, if anybody's ever won the CIB, you, have tonight, you and your guys have tonight. And I was right. But I shouldn't have said that because they got back to General Gorman and he threw a fit over that because the guys were participating in combat. So, Anyway, the elections went off, and we've got, uh, we've got a president elected and inaugurated in June of uh, 84. The, my wife was invited, invited that, and she's got a funny story to tell you about that if you want to hear it later on. It has to do, yeah, anyway. <laughs> uh, Thereafter, the situation with the FMLN out and the Christian Democrats in Duarte, the situation sort of stabilized itself and moved back to the countryside again. Not over, not over by any matter of means, because as I told you, the five Marines were shot in 85 in the Zona Rosa where they shouldn't have been. We had Greg Fronius again killed at uh, El Paraiso. And we had a helicopter crew executed in Morazan where they were shot down after that. Acts of terrorism. And then finally, the hostage barricade situation at the, at the uh, Sheridan. Now, the Zona Rosa and the Sheridan, I warned everybody about that. You know this too, don't you, Sam? Stay out of the Sheridan. Don't go to the Zona Rosa. Whatever you do, and the policy was you don't go down there, and of course the mill group people did not. But the Marines did. And you know the rest of the story, and it's a tragic end to that. And I told the gunnery sergeant that day, I think I might have mentioned this early on. I did, okay. But uh, then the hostage barricade and the situation was reduced at the Sheridan and life went on into 92 where the conflict was resolved in terms favorable to the GOES. Is this a success? Maybe. Maybe not. But 
That's the way it ended, with the participation of the FMLN in the government. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was done by your State Department, primarily. And now we've got them in control. Let me just finish this, drop this in the water here now. That's it. The government was established. My wife went to, came to the inauguration and it was a great day for all of us in that regard. Uh, I'll drop this one in the water if you don't mind, if you will, and I'll entertain your questions and comments. <laughs> Sir, if you don't mind, as we're getting ready for the uh, for the Q and A, Travis, if you could push that microphone, make sure it's on. Who's our first person with a question? We're going to get the mic going to you. Questions. There we go. Just run on over to the, that gentleman right there, sir. If we would, just before we take that first question, I want to flip through some slides with some photos and have oh, yeah. a comment on those. Roger that. Let's go up here real quick. Okay. Oh, that doesn't look good. <laughs> Well, you've seen the international infiltration one. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a couple of America's finest uh, Special Forces soldiers okay. in Uslatan just before the round one of the elections. Walt Cargill and uh, Joe Stringham. That's the day of the elect, first round of the elections. It may be the second round. I know it's the first round. And what I did that morning, early that morning, after we turned the lights on and fired them up in San Miguel, caught them with their pants down, so to speak. I got in a, a little helicopter and I flew to every single department and election voting area in El Salvador. I went out at about uh, ooh, first light and I didn't get back until almost late in the mid-morning. We had to refuel, of course, in there. And I checked every single one of these places for security and to make sure the voting could go off. And I saw the people actually lining up to vote. Of course, they were required by law to vote. Next, uh, that, that is uh, on top of uh, Guazapa, which is a volcano I demonstrated to you, showed you on, uh, on the map. And that's General Vides and me in a bunker on top of Guazapa. That actually is the first day I ever got in combat in El Salvador. We took off out of there and lo and behold. Surprise, surprise. That is also the time I went to the ambassador. I had to report these things immediately. We all did. We all did. I went in the ambassador's office, and General Gorman, the sink, was sitting there. And I said, we just got uh, fired up coming out of Guazapa. And the uh, ambassador said, well, they weren't firing at you. They are firing at the helicopter. But General Gorman didn't take it so nicely. And I... Tell me, I was kind of cheesed off about the whole thing. I said, you know, this is a funny thing for me, sir. I said, when I first went to Vietnam, the rules of engagement were, 63, 64, you don't fire unless you're returning fire, unless fired on. I said, we got a change on that in El Salvador. And he said, what's that? I said, don't get fired at. <laughs> so there's another one? Okay. There is the man, there is Leroy Santa and his team at San Salvador. Those are the guys that got attacked. And I was underlined again, they came after us. And they got, got it stuffed to them. God bless the Special Forces soldiers who did it. That's all I've got to say. I had the privilege of rewarding Leroy Santa, his combat effort in his badge, <laughs> which I, I got severely burned for telling him he should get. But... Years later, they had the ceremony, and we gave out the CIVs. It was a proud moment in my life to be able to, I was a civilian by that time, go up to Leroy Santa and say, here it is. He and I just laughed our heads off. That's uh, San Miguel after the attack. You can see this was no little attack. They had, they had uh, RPGs, and they had uh, heavy guns. Bust, those, bust that bunker apart. That's Greg Fronius. I show you about Sergeant Fronius because I'm still very bitter about this. He shouldn't have been there. 
And if he was there, he should have had a ranger buddy with him or a, another soldier there, another special forces soldier there with him. That's the way we do business. And that was the policy. And that's why I was so terribly angered about what happened to Sergeant Feronius. How, would I, how, would you, how do you say something to his parents about that? I didn't, but how, would, how do you explain to the fact that he was all by himself doing his duty for God and country and got killed? And I went into El Paraiso right after that with Sergeant Major Steve Holmesock from the USASOC. And we talked to the Salvadoran, the Guanacos on the ground and asked them about this. And Sergeant Fronius was a real hero that night. He stood by his mortar pit and he fired everything he could get his hands on, including the mortars, until he was killed. Okay? So that's it. That's it? What else we got? Anything else out there? We have a question. Yeah. Okay, with the, uh, I'm Bob Mitchell, and um, uh, with the uh, 55, is this boots on the ground, not counting the uh, the guys running around in San Salvador at the airfield and whatnot? So how did how was that defined? You're sick. Are you sick about the guy at CIA? <laughs> By the way, I flew helicopters in San El Salvador, yeah. and I don't think you counted me. <laughs> <laughs> to answer your question, you're a savvy guy. No, <laughs> we did not count you. And there were some other people that didn't get counted. And that was the helicopter pilots didn't get counted. The medics didn't get counted. That we brought a medical training team in because it was, a, it was a compassionate service to the population. Yeah, now, now, who are you speaking of, please? Who am I speaking? Yeah, yeah, you're not uh, Leon Sonnenberg in Hazelwood, are you? No, these Okay, I don't, I'm sorry, I, hey, that probably came after my time. I didn't know about them. <laughs> Maybe I did. <laughs> Other government agency. And along those things, <laughs> the number was fluid, but by golly, I, every day, at 16.30, I reported that there were 55 or whatever the number was <laughs> to the Department of Defense. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I... Okay. Yeah, yeah, we did. Thank you. It was good. Yeah. It's both a uh, comment and a question. So uh, during that same time, 2nd Battalion, 7th Group was actually in San Lorenzo. Um, during 83, 84 timeframe, we were allegedly there to, to train the uh, 11th uh, Roger that. Honduran Infantry Battalion, as you're aware. Wait, you're talking about Honduras? Now we're talking Honduras. about... Honduras. Okay, Honduras. yeah, fine. Yep, so uh, we, it was a 2nd Battalion plus. We brought a whole bunch of guys along with us. Uh, we brought a full SAD-A uh, contingent. Roger that. Uh, brought in a full CI human contingent as well. Um, comment was that a lot of the things that we were tasked to look at was to help you guys across the border as well. Roger that. And part of the part of the interdiction slash surveillance operation that we were doing was to look at not equipment coming across from Nicaragua through um, Tiger Island or to La Union was actually for personnel. Yes. And so one of the personnel that um, allegedly tried to cross over was actually uh, not Nicaraguan, not El Sal, not Hondo, but actually Cuban. So a lot of Cuban technicians were being smuggled in, in, across. In Honduras. In, not in the whole zones. Correct. Well, so just God comment. bless the 55 man limit. You were, <laughs> you were that, no, I, I, was, I was aware of that. And there were some other operations yep. going on yes, in that same area, yep. uh, but not, nothing to do with me. I, know, I knew they were going on, but they didn't have impact on the 55. Now Roger that was that. Sink South. Roger that. And uh, I, I, uh, 
I didn't, I wasn't concealing anything or anything like that, but I knew you guys were doing it, and I knew you were doing a good job. And let's build on what you were talking about. Not only was it active, the active part of what you were doing, but you were training the Salvadoran military. And the, two, one's, the, the first battle of battalion of the seventh group in Fort Bragg was to train the uh, uh, immediate action battalions at the time. They certainly weren't counted on it. I wouldn't have counted them. Yes, sir. And of course, uh, you guys in Honduras weren't counted. Um, my question. Yeah. You started this conversation today saying that the academic piece of special force and special ops is trying to learn the less, trying to teach the lessons learned. Roger that. Can you summarize for us what those lessons are, please? Excuse me, please. Can you summarize what the lessons are that they're teaching today? Yeah. Thank you. The big lesson that I, well, first of all, the big lesson I got was marginalizing the enemy and not taking them out. I can't, it's hard for me to live with something like that. They're shooting at, him, at me and they're killing my people and they're doing acts of terrorism. I thought always that you go after them and nail them as best you possibly can. That's the way I feel. That's the way all of us have been brought up. I joke about killing a communist for Christ, but damn it all anyway, that's the way things are. And that's what we're faced with today. The, uh, was there any, uh, another part other than the uh, marginalizing the, was there anything else on that that you wanted? Well, right now we got a, they're a socialist government in San Salvador, and they're sending us lovely people like Mata Salvatrucha into our cities. These are violent guys. In fact, I'm afraid some of our special forces trained these guys in years past. In fact, I would bet my front seat in hell they were. Okay? These are bad guys. They are the death squads of El Salvador now in the United States. And people, be concerned about it, because I sure am. That's MS-13, for those of you who don't know the original name, Mother Trucha. Yeah. Excuse me, please. That's MS-13. MS-13, well, I call it Mata Salva Trucha. MS-13, yeah. We have another question. I had the honor to take the uh, first team into Senfa out of third of the seventh. Uh, I was a team sergeant. Um, you mentioned briefly uh, the eastern side of, of Salvador and uh, the small SEAL contingent there, and that we, we stood up the uh, training camp in Senfa. Yes, yes. Um, yes, indeed. And we were, you know, we were supposed to be there three months. We were there much longer. Uh, and we worked with the, with the SEAL teams, training them on their interdiction uh, of the arms. Coming Roger that. And may I just interject something right now? You were counted in the 55. Please believe me. <laughs> I was. I got a pin right here, sir. Says 55. Well, well. <laughs> we 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 were we were part of the 55, and we were counted every day. Um, I uh, I lost my just due to, due to an injury. I lost my uh, team leader, and uh, uh, Hugh Scruggs or. Um, Pete Stankovich called me and said, you, you don't need another officer down there, do you, Mark? He, he had been my team sergeant years earlier. Yeah. I said, no. So we stayed there the whole time uh, and worked with the SEALs and, worked and, and stood up three Biot battalions. Yes. Uh, but what, the point that I wanted to get to is uh, every one of my AAR said that that camp was going to get overrun as well. And you didn't yeah. mention that that camp did, in fact, after I, I left, the next team went in. They got overrun as well. Roger that. You guys did a terrific, you troops did a terrific job at, at the training center. And there's a couple of things about that I'd like to share, build on that. When that center first went in, I had a, a, a reporter from the Washington Post. He had, way, he had to go with me, sir. I don't mean to interject. Oh, okay, well, somebody right. told me he had to go with me. <laughs> I, I don't know if it was you or not. <laughs> Say, put a big banner headlines, and I told her the U.S. is putting a major military base in El Salvador. 
I said, no, we're not. That's wrong. She put it in. Yeah. I rest my case right there with our we, press. We, we built it up. It was, it was in sad shape when we got And then the day before we left, we got an order from, um, uh, I think uh, Colonel Steele was the mill group commander. At the yes, time. yes. He, had, he said, uh, you got $3 million you got to spend by tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, he said, yeah. So I put my two engineers on it, and they drew a plan up and submitted it to Colonel Steele. And two years later, when I was in Honduras working the radar that was spinning over uh, Nicaraguan airspace, I got to fly with Colonel Salmon back to Senfa to see that that was built. That was, that was an extraordinary thing, that, that that training camp went up. Did they do it? It was good, sir. Oh, they did. <laughs> Thank you, sir, but I just wanted to mention, because we did, lo we did lose a guy, and that I wasn't my team, yes, but we, you, we, I didn't we realize, lost I didn't realize that, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I did not realize that. Yeah. Other question, you passed the mic. Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? This. Bye-bye. Uh, sir, I was uh, on the other side of the fence. I was sent on a, on, on a classified mission to get intel. It was myself, a captain, and a radio operator. Okay. And I was on the other side uh, checking on the refugees that were in Honduras yeah. and sending intel back to, to headquarters. And unfortunately, my captain uh, uh, met up with some press release uh, Frenchmen, and I told my captain, I said, sir, you better not get with these people. Uh -oh. So anyway, he made friends with the French they invited us to a little wine and, and cheese. So I sat down with them. They spoke English. And uh, I started listening to what the captain was saying. And I would kick him under the table. So I said, look, we got to go. He says, what's wrong? Are you, are you scared? I said, sir, I'm not, a scared, I'm not scared of anything. I said, I'm going to leave. And you better follow me. Well, he did not follow me. The next day, I'm in Tegucigalpa. I went to Tegucigalpa, and I'm getting intelligence from the newspaper. Yeah. And the first thing that I saw was Americans on the border, Green Beret on the border, and they had my name and where I was born, everything on me. And I was, I said, oh my God. So I went, so I, I uh, got me a cab. I went to the headquarters uh, and uh, this uh, MP female calls me up and says, Sergeant Major, they said, we're looking for Captain so-and-so. I said, well, I haven't seen him. And so it just happened that there was a telephone call and I said, uh, can you, can you get this telephone? This is for your captain. I said, well, let me see who it is. I said, sir, this is uh, Mr. Lopez. He says, I'm looking for captain so-and-so. And I said, who are you? He says, I'm General Haig. <laughs> he said, General, General who? Haig. <laughs> I said, sir, I said, sir, the only one I know is the secretary. <laughs> the United States of America, <laughs> and he says, I better find that man. It just happened that the captain walked in. I said, sir, somebody wants to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he says, yes, sir, I'm standing at attention. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he got a real good chewing, and as soon as he gave me the telephone, <laughs> He says, he, he says, my my career is gone. And he started hitting his head on the wall. And I said, what the heck's wrong with you? He says, that was General Hang. My career's gone. My career's gone. I said, why? He says, but what's happened? I said, you know what, Captain? I came here to find you because I saw everything about me on, on the newspaper, and we have been compromised. So I, I get a, another call from the, for the MP. He says, uh, Sergeant Major, uh, they want you at the mill groups. Colonel Fry wants to talk to you. 
<laughs> Chuck Fry, I don't know if you guys know Chuck Fry. But <laughs> so, so I went up to, I went to Chuck's office and I said, I know something happened. <laughs> he says, what the heck is going on? He says, you guys are not supposed to be compromised. I said, well, the only thing I can tell you, he says, tell me what happened. So I told him what happened. He says, we're, he says, as soon as the captain gets in here, we have to go and see the ambassador. I said, well, why do I tell him? And tell him the truth. Just, you don't say anything. So the captain comes in and, and we go to the, the ambassador's uh, office. So we, we're waiting for the ambassador. So Chuck Fries goes in first. I said, what do I tell him? He says, tell him the truth. Then I go in, Chuck comes out with his hands <laughs> between his legs, <laughs> and then the, the, captain, the captain comes in here, and about two minutes later, he comes out crying. <laughs> and he says, what happened? He says, oh, <laughs> I have to get out of the country. So anyway, he gets out. So with the, uh, he, the, the captain's replaced, and I told the, cap, the new captain, I said, sir, I know you're a captain, and I'm a sergeant major, but you better listen to me. He says, well, I'm not, I don't want to get relieved like Captain so-and-so. Anyway, we, we, the mission was compromised, and we had to go back to Panama. Sorry, Major, thanks for that. We have another question for uh, General Stringham. OK, I was in Panama while he was in El Salvador. I got an invitation to the inauguration from General Vitas Casanova. So the only airline that I could take is, was TACA, which, as my husband called it, take a chance airline. I guess all of you <laughs> know that. All right. So anyway, so I, get on, I board the plane, flying into, uh, flying into Honduras, and there's a noise on the plane. OK, I don't know what it is, but it's not natural. Anyway, we made an emergency landing without any flaps, without any brakes, in Managua, of all places, OK? S Sandino Airport, OK? So I look out the window, and I see big mounds of dirt with a gun sticking out of it, OK? So we stay on the airplane for about three hours, and finally, all the passengers are getting really dehydrated and have to go to the bathroom. So they ushered us with arms in hand, OK, into the airport waiting room. They kept us contained there, drew the curtains. We couldn't see anything. But because I'd never been there, I just pulled the curtain back. And when I did, right outside that window, was a young soldier and with a weapon that went click, click when I pulled the curtain back. So I thought, well, OK, this is not a good idea. Anyway, so finally they got the plane fixed. By the time I, had got, I got into El Salvador, it was, I was about four hours late, OK, four hours late. So I told Joe about this. I said, you know, I said, I thought, I really thought that, Nicar that Managua was just kind of like a little, you know, sandy place and everything like that. I said, but there are little houses around the airport and little shanties. And I told him about what I found out were bunkers with large guns on it, okay? So, okay, so now a few years later, okay, so Joe noted this. So a few years later, now I'm going to turn it over to Joe, because this is where he gained his notoriety. <laughs> we, were, had a, we had a meeting. We had a meeting in uh, Newport, in the Naval War College, involving Sink South, the commander of 18th Airborne Corps, my boss, General Sullivan, commander of the Reusa SOC, TAC commander. All of Southcom staff, which were all general officers, and there were two colonels at the table: me, the regimental commander of the Ranger Regiment, and the fourth Pog commander. We were the only non-flag people at the table. 
and we were doing a little war game on how to invade Danny Ortega. We got finished, and we got down to the real maneuver part of it, and they said, let us plan an airborne operation on San Dino Airport. And they went around the room, and everybody thought it was wonderful. The Sink thought it was wonderful. General Lindsay thought it was just a great idea. General Sutter, my boss, thought an airborne operation on San Dino operator. Hoo ah, hoo ah. What a great idea. And they got around to me, and they said, What was the regimental commander of the Ranger think? And I said, I don't think that's a good idea. And they looked at me like I was some kind of an idiot. And they said, Why? And I said, because it's, sur it's surrounded by a shanty town and you can't prepare the strip. And on top of all that, it's got Zoo 23 fours all the way around it. And there was a pause and the sink looked at me and he said, how in the hell do you know that? <laughs> and, I, and I swear to you, <laughs> my mother's grave, before I caught myself, I said, my wife told me. <laughs> What a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, before we wrap this up here and say our goodbyes with General Stringham, I want to say, uh, I want to have you a show, show of hands. If you were down in that theater in the 80s, either in El Salvador, Honduras, or operating in the peripheral, could you raise your hand, please? Wow. Okay. Thanks to you. Thank to you. Thanks to you. So, sir, this kind of wraps up your uh, bumping your gums, doing your mission for me. I appreciate it. Got another little nice little certificate. Okay. Throw it over to you. Yeah. General's going to pull out his credit card. Yeah. Ran out of drink tickets. I don't do this very often, and this is not a real nice thing. I have a few of these that I give out when I go worldwide. And I have a few of these that I give out worldwide, and uh, I've got most of them left. I probably got 50 out of the for, I've given out 50. Uh, it's not a great monetary value, but I'm getting far up in the line of salvation, so you might want to keep it. It might be worth some money. <laughs> so thanks a lot. This is a, uh, I'll tell you what I see on it. I see the Mike Force logo, yeah. it's SF. And then we share our common Ranger Regiment bond, sir. Okay, so here we go. Brigadier General Joe Stringham, Ranger Hall of Fame, distinguished member of your Special Forces Regiment. Sir, thank you. Thank you, sir.